My name is Ronald Bailey. I will be the moderator for this evening's debate. It is a debate among friends on the proposition that was agreed to as follows. Under no circumstances should conservatives support a tax on carbon emissions. Let me set up a little bit of the ground rules here. This was, by the way, these were the rules that were agreed to by both sides in this debate. Uh, the, the, the debate is not about climate change science per se, but about the desirability of taxing carbon. The debaters on both sides stipulate some amount of climate change is occurring and the human beings have some influence on it. Also, that the future consequences of this climate change, by definition, cannot be known with certainty. The debate was organized by the R Street Institute and the Heartland Institute, and I want to thank them for making this possible for us to discuss this important issue. Um, there are two teams. There are, is a rather complicated set of rules. I will be asking questions most of the evening, but eventually each side will be able to address one another. And at the end, if we have time and we can turn the lights up, I would like to have a straw poll to see what y'all think, which way we should go. Does the, uh, the resolution pass or not? So without further ado, let me introduce our debaters. On the, for those who are uh, for the proposition are James Taylor, who is a managing editor at Environment and Climate News uh, at Heartland Institute, where, and he is a senior fellow there where he focuses on energy and environmental issues. And David Kreutzer, who is a research fellow at energy, uh, in energy and economics and climate change at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, where he researches how energy and climate change legislation will affect economic activity at the national, local, and industry levels. And against the proposition, are Bob Inglis, who is the executive director of the Energy and Enterprise Initiative based at George Mason University, and he is a former congressman from South Carolina. The institute focuses on economic growth, limited government, liberty, accountability, and reasonable risk avoidance to solve our nation's energy and climate challenges. And our fourth debater is Andrew Moylan from the R Street Institute, where he is a senior fellow, and he heads the coalition efforts and conducts policy analysis and serves as the organization's lead voice on taxes. And this, of course, is the tax issue. So the way we're going to begin this is each team, and they've agreed to do this, will have six minutes to begin the de their debate. They'll have opening statements. And I believe that those who are, are against the proposition, that would be uh, Mr. Inglis and Mr. Moylan, have the floor first for six minutes. And our timer is where? OK. And how are you going to indicate when the six minutes is up? You will raise your hand and I will look at you. OK. All right. So whenever I'm calling you, by the way, Team Go is your turn for now. Great. Whoops. There's the water. Oh, let's see. No, you're going uh, there. We're going that way. Yeah, exactly. um, thank you to R Street for doing this and Heartland for coming together for a debate among friends. Uh, that is a great way to cast it and uh, particularly appreciate uh, everybody joining. Um, so we're um, in the position of arguing against that proposition that uh, conservatives should not be considering a price on carbon. And I think we should start by noting that this is a conversation about climate change that was started by liberals, and therefore we conservatives feel a little bit uncomfortable in it. Um, I think it also has to do with the fact that we have the world's most undeserved inferiority complex when it comes to energy and climate. We just think we're no good, that we don't have any answer. But the truth is, we've got the answer. The answer is free enterprise. The answer is a cop on the beat that forces accountability for all fuels so that all costs are in on all fuels and that there's a true cost comparison between the competing fuels and the cop calls the, the, the calls for either side, for all the fuels, without partiality to any fuel. So in other words, there are no subsidies, either, ex either explicit subsidies or implicit subsidies. So we're hoping, our team is hoping to change the conversation tonight, to change it from this conversation that was started by liberals, where the assumption is that if we're going to act on energy and climate, 
then what necessarily follows is that we're going to grow the government, we're going to increase the size and scope of the nanny state, we're going to lose individual freedom and liberty, and we're going to be wholly unaccountable and irresponsible the way that we normally as conservatives see government. So what we want to do is change that conversation so that rather than assuming that if there's a problem, the answer is a big government in any state, that the answer is actually a smaller government. Because we're actually the only team in town that's offering a tax cut on income. No one else in town, I think, is bold enough right now to be talking about a tax cut on income. But we are. We're talking about cutting taxes on income and switching that tax to emissions, Pagovian tax swap. And so with the, old, with the whole question here tonight, I think we'll come down to simply this. If you can do a Pagovian tax swap, in other words, tax things that you want less of and untax things you want more of, the question is whether there are negative externalities associated with that thing you want less of, emissions. And that, I think, will be the nub of the question here tonight, is whether there are negative externalities. So we'll look forward to the conversation. And uh, now from my partner, Andrew, will add some thoughts. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Boylan. Uh, senior Fellow and Outreach Director at the R Street Institute. R Street is a free market think tank, a relatively new one. Uh, it used to be the Center on Finance, Insurance, and Real Estate within the Heartland Institute. So we are uh, among friends, and in some cases, for some of my colleagues, former coworkers. Uh, I want to list off some things that I think that R Street and, and our opponents tonight probably agree on. Uh, that the federal government should be smaller. That taxes should be lower and less damaging to our economy that tax increases are antithetical to our principles and should be rejected, uh, that we shouldn't subsidize any energy, whether it's foolish green projects or traditional energy, uh, that we don't have any kind of vendetta against traditional energy. We should build the Keystone Pipeline, for example. We should explore and export more natural gas. Uh, furthermore, we agree that climate change is inherently difficult to predict, of course, but doesn't seem likely to be catastrophic for the United States. That said, an uncontroversial conservative response to climate change could be working to eliminate subsidies for development in sensitive areas like the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, encouraging common sense mitigation and adaptation efforts to any change in climate. <clears throat> but perhaps the most important thing that the federal government can do is to enact policies that make America wealthier and more prosperous in order to deal with the potential impacts, including less burdensome taxes and regulation. The strongest defense to any climate impact is a richer America. So in any case, Americans can do relatively little on our own to impact global emissions, let alone global temperatures. So I, I think that it's important to note what the status quo is today, though, that we have a, a, a problematic status quo for two main reasons. One is that we have a dumb, expensive, economically inefficient tax code that uh, punishes income and investment, that makes it hard for America to be competitive globally. We also have a dumb, expensive, economically inefficient regulatory scheme that empowers EPA to create a de facto price on carbon that is uneven and non-transparent through heavy-handed regulation. And so here is where we part company, that if I'm understanding our opponents correctly, they have a reasonable plan to deal with one of those problems, the tax code. But at our street, we believe that we can address both of those issues with a carbon tax that meets three important tests. The first is that it's legitimately revenue neutral to prevent growth of government. The second is that it eliminates existing taxes outright to shut off avenues into taxpayer wallets. And the third is that it combine, is combined with legitimate regulatory preemption to avoid layering a carbon taxation so, regime on top of a carbon regulation regime. So that's the, the proposition that we're going to be debating tonight, and I look forward to hearing more from our opponents. I was going to commend you, but you're a minute and a half over. <clears throat> so from team no, we will first hear from James Taylor. Oh, one other thing as a housekeeping matter that I forgot to do, and it was my fault as a moderator, this is being t uh, videotaped by Showtime. They're going to be doing a special. And if anyone objects to being videotaped, there's a person that they've designated that you can go to and object to it. That would be that person there. So if you don't want to appear on television, talk to that woman. Thank you. Does that apply to panelists? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. 
All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for braving the elements in making it here today. I think we all owe a sincere apology, or not a sincere apology, a sincere thank you to Al Gore. Because if Al came, the precipitation we had would have been snow. And you know how much more difficult it is to drive through snow than it is to rain. So thank you, Al, for not being here so we could all show up, make it to the debate. Now, I love my friends at R Street. I, I love Bob Inglis. But I feel like countering their proposal is like trying to argue against pixie dust. And let me tell you what I mean. The assertion is that if we accept this brand new tax, this tax on carbon, well, then we're going to balance this off by giving up taxes elsewhere. And that somehow government not only is going to give up those taxes, they're going to honor those taxes and not just jack them back up two years down the line. Now, if you are believing that government really will honor that promise, you probably believed George Bush the first when he said, read my lips, no new taxes. You probably believed him afterwards when he said, no, 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 wait a minute. I got a promise that Congress will cut spending. So I took a little bit of extra taxes, but now we've solved our deficit problem forever. You probably believe both of those because it's the same concept. You probably believe the federal government in 1986 when they said, let's just grant amnesty to the illegal immigrants, and then once we do so, we'll really get tough and enforce the border. We won't have any more immigration problem. It's the same argument. You probably believe the folks who are arguing for Obamacare when they said, no, listen, those of you that are objecting for religious reasons because this is going to pay for abortions, it's not going to do it. You have our word. Again, government cannot be trusted to keep its promises, and especially when it comes to a promise not to add new taxes. In theory, perhaps, perhaps in la-la land, we can get the government to cut an equal amount of taxes as a carbon tax raise would be, but they're not going to stick to that. It's like arguing against pixie dust. Not only are they arguing for pixie dust, I fear they're smoking pixie dust if they believe that. All in good favor, in good humor, of course. <laughs> now, here's another point that's just as important. All that they are taking in, in terms of, well, all that they are compensating for is revenue they take in during a carbon tax. But the whole point of a carbon tax is to induce energy providers to stop producing coal power, natural gas power, you name it. So every time that an energy producer now switches to solar or wind power, then they're not paying the tax. Society bears the cost. We are paying more for our electricity bills. We're paying more for our energy bills. But because government's not collecting any revenue, there's no compensation coming on the back end for tax abatement. So we are going to pay a severe cost as a society for this trade, which will end up not being a trade. It's also important to note that government already strongly tilts the, the playing field in favor of wind power, solar power, carbon-free energy technologies, and against carbon-intensive energy technologies. EPA has essentially banned coal power plants for the future. They're already paying incredible prices for this. I don't see where they have eliminated EPA regulations. I don't see where they've leveled the playing field. They need to do that to even begin having the conversation. Now, I have about 50 other points, but I think David would probably like to speak. So I'm going to hand the baton over to him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I don't know if my timer is going to work in another three minutes. I don't know what I have left, but I'll get going. First of all, Bob, I am not at all embarrassed if we want to debate climate. It doesn't, I'm, I'm happy to do it, do it all the time, and I smile. Um, the other thing <clears throat> is that we need to talk about, we were told this is a debate about the economics of a carbon tax. So let's run through that. We've run that analysis at Heritage. It's very similar to the results that they got at the EIA. You would have an impact on family of four of lost income of about $1,000 per year. Um, you would see coal production drop by 60%, coal employment drop by 40%. You would see natural gas prices go up by about 40% as it shifts to replace that coal. So if you're worried about export terminals, forget it. This impact is much heavier. <clears throat> Gasoline prices, of course, go up. And you're going to take 120 to $200 billion a year out of the private economy, put it into the public economy, into the government. This is where uh, Bob and Andrew start to tell you, now imagine what you could do with this. Close your eyes and think of all the fun things you could do with that. You could cut this tax, you could cut that tax. It's not going to happen. This is where I come in and say, get real. All right? We've seen what happens. You drag $100 billion a year across Washington, you've got to go up and down K Street. Every special interest is grabbing at it. You've got to go to the House side. Every special interest again comes in. Different special interests on the Senate side. Reconciliation, more special interests. Got to go up to the White House. You have to satisfy those special interests. Just look at the Waxman-Markey bill. 
started out at 600 and some pages, went to 900 and some pages. While they're debating it, their aides are coming up and putting in new pages, taking out old pages. 1,427 pages by the time it got passed. That money that they collected that was going to do these wonderful things, 97% of it was given away to special interest for the first 10 years. It's a, it's a fantasy to think that you're going to be able to cut a corporate income tax. In any event, that's not what our street apparently wants to do. This is actually about climate. How do I know? Earlier this year, actually end of last year, the National Tax Payers Union and R Street came up with a proposal to cut $190 billion a year from the Pentagon. All right, $1.9 trillion in 10 years. That's about what a carbon tax would generate. Why didn't they say, let's use this to buy down the corporate income tax? Because the carbon tax has nothing to do with that. It's about, it's about climate. Um, Andrew, a year ago, sent a letter to the, uh, the governor of Ohio. He said, look, you're going to tax oil and gas so that you can reduce an income tax, that's stupid. Cut spending. That's what we need to do. We need to cut spending if we want to cut corporate income tax. All right, I think I'm at the end and all my other points will come in later. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next section, uh, are basically I'm going to ask each team a single question and they will have three minutes to answer it and the other team will have one minute to rebut whatever it is they say. And because I, I enjoy talking about pixie dust and fantasies, I'm going to ask uh, Team Go the question. Don't they really have a very good point over there? Isn't, it, isn't a revenue neutral carbon tax a fantasy? Doesn't experience show that whatever carbon tax Congress and the White House adopts, the revenues raised will be diverted to supporting some other more urgent program than the far distant mm -hmm. problem of climate change, such as an underfunded Medicare system? Three minutes, right? Um, well, if that's true, we need to write to the monarchy and ask him to come back and tell them that the experiment in self-government has failed, that we are not capable of governing ourselves, and really we want you back because we need some wise one over us to make decisions for us because we can't do it. I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to make that concession. I believe that a free people can govern themselves. And the point that James made, actually he undercuts his very point by referencing George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush did say, read my lips. George H.W. Bush was not returned to the White House. We got Bill Clinton instead. Which makes another point here, if we want to talk politics, about was that a good outcome? In other words, was the purity on, imposed on George H.W. Bush a good thing or a bad thing for conservatives? Or might it have been better to choose George H.W. Bush rather than William Jefferson Clinton? But I guess that comes down to the purity question that we'll face here throughout the night. So uh, the main answer, I think, is simply rise up, Americans. Realize that you are free citizens impose accountability on your elected officials. If they don't do something you like, you get rid of them. That's what free people do. And I, I would say in the brief time we have left that the real fantasy is assuming that there's a status quo that uh, is somehow acceptable. The status quo as it exists today is EPA greenhouse gas regulation that costs at a minimum $140 billion a year. And so uh, I, I think that if there's any pixie dust, it's that we're going to get rid of that without substituting some other sort of policy uh, that addresses the same issues. And we have yet to hear uh, from folks on the other side about how they would do that. I congratulate you. That was two minutes. You now have one minute. I'll just begin by saying, use your common sense. Use your heads. I'd love to think that it's true that government would never abuse the tax power. I'd love to think it's true that George Bush never went back on his word, that Congress has never gone back on their words, that immigration was solved in 1986, that Obamacare never did uh, end up paying for abortions, things like that. We can't trust government. That's, that's just common sense. We know it to be the case. Um, I would like to add. I am worried about our ability for our democracy to govern itself. We have deficits that are going wild, all right? I certainly don't want the king to come back, but with, we, with spending at near record percentage of GDP, it seems odd that the solution is a $200 billion per year tax. I enjoy the succinctness of these responses. Let's, let's continue. Um, 
In other words, I'm assuming the team no thinks that we can't be self-governing. No, we'll, we'll move on. Team, no. No, I don't think that's Let's turn all. around the question. These are team go, your team no. That's why I'm thinking about it. They're going for taxes, you're against taxes, so you're no. Let's turn it around. Since it's agreed that some amount of, and it was agreed, that some amount of human-caused climate change is in fact occurring, some have argued that a carbon tax, uh, for a carbon tax, so that people will be encouraged to switch to low and no carbon fuels as a kind of insurance policy against the possibility of remote, but nevertheless real, chance of catastrophic climate change. Are there any circumstances in which you would support an absolutely guaranteed neutral carbon tax, or is it just not possible? You know, this is not a freshman philosophy debate where we say, what if it cured childhood diseases? What if it ended all poverty? We're talking about a serious issue here, and we're talking about a carbon tax. Conservatives, if somebody says, hey, I want to talk to you about a carbon tax, and say, stop, right there. You already know the answer, because it's not going to happen. Um, you know, we did not agree that there's, a, that there's a significant chance of catastrophic climate change, all right? So we, we, we can throw that off the board right now. And let me add that there have been demonstrated benefits, many demonstrated benefits to the warming. It's a good thing we're not in the Little Ice Age anymore. I mean, reporters from the New York Times have reported that if it weren't for the carbon dioxide that we've added, scientists believe we might be back in a full-blown ice age. We know the deserts are shrinking around the globe. We know crop production is expanding. We know the biosphere is becoming more rich. We know there's fewer droughts. We know that in so many ways, as our planet has warmed, it is a more conducive planet to human welfare. And that has always been the case when temperatures have warmed. And it's when temperatures have cooled that we face these problems. So the mere notion that climate is changing, which by the way it always has, does not mean A, that we're facing a crisis, or B, that we need to do something about it. I've, I think to David's point, this, uh, it, no, this is not a high school philosophy debate. It's a debate about a very serious issue. Uh, and I think that we are treating it in a very serious manner. But the, the kind of proposals that we're putting forward are the sorts of things that we think meet conservative principles, are the sorts of things that uh, if you could sit down and, and draft it up, that's what we're proposing, that's what we're debating today. Uh, the left has no problem doing the same thing. The, the, the carbon tax, for example, that you mentioned, that you modeled, which is a terrible idea and I would oppose because it's a carbon tax layered on top of everything else we already pay, would indeed have all of those negative effects. It, it, it is no more politically likely in some ways in the here and now than what we're talking about. This is how these debates work. One side makes a proposal. The other side makes a proposal. We have an argument about which one makes sense. We have an argument about which one meets our principles. The bill that you mentioned does not do that. I think that the proposal that we are talking about here does. Yeah, very important just to underscore that, that uh, David's uh, study was a revenue positive carbon tax. We're talking a revenue neutral carbon tax. Again, the only team in town that's offering you a tax cut on income. It's also, I think, very interesting that uh, James has uh, said that this uh, isn't I'm, so. I'm sorry, your minute is up. Well, we have more debate questions coming. Sorry. Uh, the, we have to be fair on the time. The uh, next set of questions are going to be two sets of questions, two for each team, and they'll have three minutes each with one minute rebuttal from each team. And I'm going to go with uh, Mr. Inglis and Mr. Moylan again. Uh, would you oppose any carbon tax that is not revenue neutral, or is it more important to set a price on carbon pollution to begin the process of ratcheting down the dangers of future man-made climate change? Um, we at Energy Enterprise Initiative would, in fact, oppose any revenue-positive carbon tax. Um, that's one of the reasons I voted against cap-and-trade. I think cap-and-trade was a terrible idea, hopelessly complicated, massive tax increase, decimated American manufacturing. Um, and uh, uh, so for all those reasons, uh, it, was, it should have been a non-starter. Um, so it, what we're looking for is revenue neutrality. Um, and, and by the way, if I can explain revenue uh, cost neutrality as well, um, uh, we were accused of smoking pixie dust, uh, but I would tell you that you gotta believe in the tooth fairy in order to believe there's such a thing as a free lunch. And does anybody here really think that we're not currently paying the full cost of, for example, coal-fired electricity? 23,600 people die prematurely each year in the United States because of the soot from coal-fired electrical plants. Um, if you put those costs on the meter, we'd see that there's more than what's on the meter. 
But there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's what we believe as conservatives. Now, if you're a liberal, this is the problem with the liberals. They actually believe there's such a thing as a free lunch. And that somehow you can create something out of nothing. But we know there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're paying the full cost of all the fuels, just not at the meter, not at the pump. If you paid at the meter and paid at the pump, the liberty of enlightened self-interest would create demand-driven innovation. But we sit here without any need for innovation because we don't know the real price. And isn't that, by the way, especially what libertarians are for, is full accountability in marketplaces so that you can see the real cost. I would say uh, I agree wholeheartedly that our street would oppose any revenue positive carbon tax, in large part because we come at this not so much through the climate lens, but through the lens of tax reform. Uh, we look at it as a means for uh, positive tax reform and regulatory reform, uh, rather than dealing a, a climate issue with American policy, which American policy has relatively little ability to do anyway in a global economy. And if we have any time left, I'd say we're not, as you pointed out, for the tax. We're pro-tax reform. We are not just for a tax. We're for changing what we tax. It's tax reform. It's in the context of tax reform. Well, I think, first of all, even if you believe, I don't think there's more than a handful of conservatives, relatively speaking, who believe that government is not going to raise the taxes after they say that they will, they will cut them. I mean, you, you, can, you can say that that's anti-American. It's being realistic, and I don't think conservatives are anti-American. When they say that they, are not for a reven they demand revenue neutrality, they're not talking economic neutrality. Remember the point that I made that they haven't addressed because they can't address it. It's because the whole point of a carbon tax is to force us to switch to more expensive energy sources for which the tax will not apply because they've made the switch. They're not paying the tax. The economy suffers, and we don't get any type of, of feedback on that. Finally, they talk about carbon as if that's the only externality there is. Carbon dioxide itself is beneficial, but they're not talking about bird kills, bald eagle kills, condor kills from wind turbines, land development 300 plus square miles for a wind turbine farm to replace a regular coal-fired power plant, etc. You can't pick and choose and cherry pick which, ter which externalities you want to talk about, even if you were right. Let, 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 let's get down to the reality here. We have record spending. All right, we need to cut spending. People from our street have said, hey, we can cut spending, we can cut 190 billion per year. That's the, that's the carbon tax revenue that you need to cut the corporate income tax that you also talk about. How about doing it that way? Why take the risk? We've seen it over and over. I'm not talking about it, it losing faith in democracy. I've seen okay. what happens. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be going to uh, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Kreutzer. Assuming that politicians and policymakers are going to do something to address man-made climate change, and in fact, we already know they are, including a plethora of regulations, which you've already cited, so, uh, energy efficiency standards for light bulbs, appliances, cafe standards for cars, massive subsidies for bioethanol, wind, solar, nuclear, various cabin and trade systems like the one just adopted in California. Given all that, wouldn't a carbon tax be a much better and cheaper second best policy to address the problem of climate change? No, it would be a second thing on top of all the things you talked about. They've made it very clear, the people that supposedly are going to be negotiating with us, the liberals, that they have no intent of giving up on the EPA regulations. Um, you know, this was not supposed to be a climate debate, all right? But that's, if it's going to be, then we need to take that. We need to say, what's going to happen to climate with your tax, with your regulations? We know what happens. Virtually nothing. So if we're seriously thinking this is some sort of solution and not just some sort of window dressing or pretending we're doing something, it's a useless policy. It's an expensive tax. It has no impact on climate. And it's not going to be reciprocated with a cut of an income tax somewhere else. Right. I haven't seen, I haven't heard anywhere in this debate where they talk about they're going to eliminate the EPA regulations which are destroying our economy and for which there is no compensatory tax cut right now. They're saying that the big government alarmists, the environmental activists, they can cut and take away everything they can. And once they finally reach a threshold where the American public won't take anymore, then we'll bargain with them so they can get the rest as well. I don't think that's a very good idea at all. And if the question is, well, but there's going to be some action anyway. Isn't this better and we might as well come to the table and have a seat? No, I'm not going to support it because it's not right. I don't support things that aren't right. Uh, you all have two minutes. I have a quick interjection. This is a debate not with the liberals. It's with your colleagues here. They're saying this is a second best policy. It's a better policy. It's as a I understand policy. it. As you mentioned at the beginning, this is where the genesis The debate is not with was. the people on Capitol Hill. It's here in this room. And they're saying it's a second best policy. Tell them why it's not even. 
but it's not a good second best policy. You still have oh. a minute and a half. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's not a second best policy because we know there's not going to be a substitute. This is, this is the trick they do over and over. They, they are not doing it. No, no, they want to capitulate to the liberals and say, hey, look, we will give you the carbon tax, all right, and then you give us something back, and implying that there's something is bad, like a cut in the corporate income tax, when we've just seen over and over, look what happens. You can't expect the, uh, $200 billion to go across town unmolested. It's not going to be used to cut a corporate income tax. Why isn't the corporate income tax already cut? You can make all these great arguments for it. You can say, look, we should raise the, the, the personal income tax a little bit and, and drop the corporate income tax because it all gets paid for by people anyway. We don't have that. And Ron, I don't think you were listening to my answer because I said at the very beginning that their proposal is not going to eliminate all of the regulations, all of the restrictions that are already in place such that we can never have another coal-fired power plant built again, such that there's additional costs imposed artificially on these energy sources, and there are subsidies to wind and solar. You have to take all those off the table to even have an honest discussion about a level playing field and costs and benefits. So that is certainly not the best option to throw this on top of everything else that's out there. That, I mean, well, let, the, the, okay. the better option would be to eliminate everything else first, then we can have the discussion. I'll tell you it's still wrong, but that's why it's not the best even among competing bad ideas. So let's respond to that. Uh, we actually are saying exactly that, to get rid of EPA greenhouse gas regulations, yes. to get rid of CAFE regulations. But there's a difference between just saying it, because we're both probably saying that. We both probably would like to get rid of it. The difference is we actually have a plan to do it. The difference is that what we are proposing is a substitute, because whether we like it or not, carbon pricing of some form, either in ham-handed regulatory fashion by bureaucrats at EPA, or by the most powerful signal that man has ever known, the price signal, uh, is going to happen. What we are saying is substitute that price signal for that regulation, do it in a revenue neutral way that eliminates taxes, that doesn't make government bigger. That's something that makes sense. We actually have a plan we're proposing to do that. I haven't heard, other than wishing they would go away, what your plan would be. All right. Thank you. Our next question will be going to, uh, again, uh, Mr. Inglis and uh, Mr. Moylan. Let's talk inter intergenerational equity, all right? Right now, the average per capita income on planet Earth is somewhere around $11,000 a year uh, per person. Uh, of course, not very evenly distributed, but nevertheless, that's what it meets out to. In the worst case scenario outlined in the Stern Review, climate change would reduce average per capita income in the year 2100 from $100,000, if there were no climate change, down to $80,000 per year. How much should people making $11,000 per year now sacrifice to people three generations hence who would make $100,000 in order that they can make $100,000 instead of $80,000? Or how much would you have wanted your grandparents to sacrifice so that the temperature would be one degree cooler than it is now? I would say not only nothing, less than nothing. Okay. Because what we are proposing is not a tax layered on top of everything else. What we are proposing is a tax swap, and not just any old tax swap, but a tax swap that is pro-growth in nature, a tax swap that shifts our taxation away from things that we like that are unequivocally good, which everybody in this room agrees are good, like income and investment, uh, and in favor of things that are, depending on your perspective on the, the climate issue, which is not the center of this debate, are either neutral uh, or bad, which is carbon dioxide emissions. So what we're talking about doesn't actually impose any costs on net. Uh, on people in the present to pay for reductions in the future. Are you, I'm sorry, are you saying that your, with your tax, it basically would not raise the price of energy to anybody? It, it raises the price of energy while at the same time taking less money from them in other areas. So, for example, the, a, a carbon tax of you know, $1.2 trillion is what the CBO said over 10 years. Uh, that's enough to get rid of capital gains taxes, dividends taxes, estate taxes, and tariffs tomorrow. Does anybody actually think that our world would not be better off if we got rid of all four of those taxes, that growth would not be better, that incomes on the whole would not be better? So what we're talking about is pro-growth in the short term and certainly pro-growth in the long term. And we're talking about uh, all cost in. So to James' point about the, uh, the birds that are affected by wind turbines, yes, that should be considered. Those are externalities associated with wind. They should be on the wind power. Uh, just as uh, all other fuels should bear all their cost. And then the free enterprise system sorts out who wins and loses, right? Um, I thought the question was maybe going to a place that I can definitely agree with something the Heritage has talked about, which is the moral imperative of allowing the developing world to develop. 
Um, and I think that's something that David has spoken about. He's right about that. And that's why we say on this handout you have before us, we, we want more energy, not less. We want more mobility, not less. We're not with the people who want to shiver or sweat in the dark, depending on what season it is. We want more energy, more mobility. And the way to do that in the developing world, by the way, is to give them the opportunity to leapfrog, just as they've done with smartphones. They will leapfrog in energy. And they will go beyond this centralized system to a distributed system. And it'll be a great thing. And America the blessed will be a blessing to people around the world. Uh, let me first point out that this premise that you have, that climate change is going to cause all this economic damage, I fundamentally disagree with that. I disagree with that strongly, and according to the terms of the debate, I'm not allowed to tell you why, but let me just point that out. A warmer planet, a planet with more atmospheric carbon dioxide, has benefited human welfare and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And let me just also address the analogy with smartphones. They talk about smartphones, but what they're proposing is for us to go back in time to wind turbines and solar panels. It's like saying that we have to have a certain amount of our uh, communications coming from telegraphs rather than cell phones. I kind of prefer cell phones. To, to say that you're taxing carbon and not fossil fuel energy, which is 85% of our energy in the US, is like saying, no, I'm in favor of taxing eggshells, but not the eggs. All right, you, 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 can, you can pull the sulfur dioxide out, you can pull the nitrous oxides out, but when you burn carbohydrates, excuse me, or hydrocarbons, you get carbon dioxide in fixed proportions. A tax on carbon dioxide is a tax on natural gas, it is a tax on petroleum, it is a tax on coal, and those are our main energy sources. There's nothing in the, in the horizon that's going to substitute for that, and that's where the economic damage comes. You, you can't redistribute that because it's gone from the economy. That's the problem with this narrow-based high tax. Thank you very much. And a final question for me, and then we'll turn it to the, each team who will ask each other a question. And it's now to Mr. Taylor and Mr. Kreutzer. And despite the fact uh, that you don't like it, we have agreed for purposes of this debate that global warming is occurring and that it is an, therefore an open access commons problem. In, con in other contexts, free market and property rights proponents like yourselves, like everyone in this audience, I assume, argue that when people are damaging a resource, they should be forced to internalize the costs by paying for the damage they do. A carbon tax is one way of, uh, to oblige people to take into account the damage they're causing to other people. Uh, isn't it somewhat inconsistent for property rights and free market people like yourselves uh, to, to, to oppose this kind of way of addressing the problem of, of carbon dioxide and climate change? As somebody that taught economics for 25 years, I'm heartened that so many people went to the lecture on externalities. I'm hugely disappointed you left in the middle. All right? But yes, one way to tax this is to have a tax on the externality. Another way is to have regulations. Now, you can argue which is more effective and so on. But we have, um, we have power companies already paying billions of dollars to control the, the pollution. All right? Indirectly, they're controlling CO2 as well. All right? So it's, it's completely disingenuous to say, well, we have this externality. We don't have any control. Yes, we are. We're spending billions on the control. And we're not going to get rid of that by adding a carbon tax. And let me just add two points. First of all, you're assuming that the effects of carbon dioxide are negative. As I've said repeatedly, and I'd be happy to have another hour-long debate any time in the future, the effects of CO2 are positive, not negative, and they will continue to be so. I'm certainly glad we're not still in the Little Ice Age. Let me also point out that this is cherry-picking a particular externality. You want to talk about carbon, even if it were negative, then what about all of the effects in terms of wildlife that are killed by wind turbines, water usage from solar panels, extensive land development that's necessary to replace a single coal-fired or uh, natural gas power plant. You can't just pick and choose which externalities you want to address. You either have to address them all or you address none of them. Yeah, to be clear, James, that's exactly what we want to do. We want all costs in on all fuels. So yes, you got to be fully accountable. If you're a wind farm operator, you're fully accountable for all those costs. If you're a coal-fired plant, you're fully accountable for all those costs. And by the way, there's an IGCC machine that would happily uh, sequester the CO2 if the geology suits it. But the reason we don't do that is that it's not economic. And this, of course, is something in David's uh, field is if you, made the, if you set the economics right, if you made them fully accountable, 
then the IGCC machine might be doable. As it is, it's not. And the reason it's not is they get a freebie in the air. If you can dump in the trash dump in the sky without accountability, stinks for those with lung impairments, but if you're not accountable for that, then of course your power is cheaper or looks cheaper. But again, unless you believe there's a tooth fairy, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're paying all those costs just through an opaque healthcare system, not at the meter. Now we get to the portion of the debate where each team may ask each other two questions. Do you, I, I think you'd probably like to do them sequentially, one and one, one and one. And since I asked the first question of uh, Mr. Moreland and Mr. English, they get to ask the first question of Mr. Taylor and Mr. Kreutzer. So shall I? Sure, go for it. Yeah, so uh, I want to basically go back to Ron's question for, for you all, which is I've been talking some about the negative externalities associated with the combustion of fossil fuels in the form of soot, small particulates. Um, and uh, I wonder if you're willing to admit that there's a health cost there, or do you also maintain that that cost is zero? You maintain that the CO2 cost is zero, or even, I don't know what that would be, negative cost, I guess. In other words, it would be positive. Um, but uh, do you also maintain that the, that, that the other emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, that that also is a zero cost? Since you went back to the question, I'll go back to my answer, okay? Um, the, the carbon dioxide is not soot. Carbon dioxide is non-toxic, colorless, and invisible, all right? We have regulations for soot. We have expensive regulations for soot. We have people already controlling soot. Now, is the optimal amount of soot zero? Since you're talking about externalities and supply and demand economics, you know that's not true, all right? So if you think we've, we're under controlling soot, then talk about a soot tax, all right? But you're not. We have soot regulations. Um, we have the EPA already has the authority to control the soot to the level without consideration of cost that they think is safe. We don't need any more, all right? And let me just add, if I may, that for example, if you're taxing carbon, you're not even closely uh, addressing what you're getting at now, which are these soot problems. Natural gas reduces the six principal pollutants that EPA tracks by 90% across the board. The only thing it doesn't reduce by at least 90% is carbon dioxide, which is odorless, which doesn't cause any of these problems. So if you want to attack soot, then attack soot, but don't attack carbon dioxide because it's not a good fit. Isn't that a good argument for price signal, though? You get one minute if you'd like to respond. Well, I guess it, my, my point would be that that's a very good argument for price signal, right? Is it, and, and David, I wonder, are you content with a regulatory price? What we're talking about is finding the marginal cost of those externalities and then attaching that. And you're right, in some of your writings, you're exactly right. You don't want to go beyond that marginal cost. You don't want to, for example, have a congestion tax in New York City that's $1,000 per car because to do so would be, it would fix the congestion problem, but it would in fact stop commerce in New York City. So you want to find the marginal cost, but what you seem to be rejecting is the idea that we can find this marginal cost and then attach it, and that you're content actually with regulation as the cost, which seems to me is a, a very blunt instrument and not what we conservatives are usually for. What we're usually for is price signals. Next, you get a question, if you like. It's your turn for your first question, you, and uh, then you'll have two minutes to respond, and then you'll have a minute to rebut. Okay. Andrew, as I mentioned a year ago, um, you wrote a letter to Governor Kasich of Ohio, and you said it is not a good idea to tax oil and gas to, for the benefit of cutting an income tax. What I want to know is what's happened in the past year? Was it the wonderful deal that conservatives got on the fiscal cliff negotiation where they got a tax increase of $60 billion a year and a promise of something that never happened except for a request for more taxes. You said the best way to make room for an income tax cut is to cut spending. We have record spending as a percent of GDP. What's happened between June of 2012 and June of 2013 that has switched you from wanting to not tax energy to taxing it? So two responses. First, uh, on the spending side, you're absolutely right that we need to reduce spending. And I'm, I'm gratified that you brought one example of how we've laid out exactly how to do that here. Uh, on your, the first part of your question, though, about what was different about Ohio versus now, the answer is this, that what was being proposed in Ohio was a very narrow tax 
on oil extraction, essentially. Hmm. Uh, what we're talking about here is very broad base. We're talking about the entirety of the energy economy, essentially, uh, which is, you know, you, you called it a narrow base. I, I think that uh, the analysis would suggest that that's incorrect, that it's a very wide base. Uh, and we're talking about relatively low rates. You know, e even when you uh, look at some of the effects on energy prices, they're relatively small. So uh, the average effect on, for example, electricity prices and gasoline prices, if you look at what an average family drives, an average homeowner, it's about $250 a year. So for the kinds of tax reductions that we're talking about, capital gains, whatever it might be, if you wanted to do income or, or uh, corporate income taxes, you might have to convince me about why that's a better idea. Uh, but I, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue uh, that we couldn't reduce people's liabilities by more than that. Andrew, come, I get a response, right? You get a, a come, come back to the light, Andrew. Here's what you said at the end of your letter. There's a better, more fiscally responsible way to achieve income tax cuts. You didn't say this fiscally more responsible way is to have a broader tax. The problem with your proposal is it doesn't include coal, and it doesn't include gasoline at the pump, and it doesn't include gasoline coming from other states. You said the fiscally responsible way to achieve income tax cuts is trimming back wasteful spending to reduce the burden of government. That doesn't apply to the federal government in 2013? It absolutely does, and we've suggested exactly that. You have the report in your hand. Sorry, do I get to respond <laughs> yeah. to that? And now you get your final question to uh, the, the other team. Uh, they get two minutes to respond, and you'll get a minute to rebut. Sure. So uh, let's, because I want to get at the philosophy, because I think it's important. I think that there's something, uh, a kernel at the very uh, bottom here that we haven't really gotten to, and it's this. Stipulate for a moment that we pass a revenue neutral carbon tax that has regulatory preemption. Would you agree or disagree that the federal government after passing that would be more limited in size and scope? We, we, we said at the beginning this is not a philosophy class where we're talking about what if this or that. We know that that will not happen. We know that people will get sucked into saying, well, yeah, I think I would in that. Boom, you're labeled. He's in favor of a carbon tax. And then you say, yeah, if it, you know, if it, well, no, why, why do you want to cut it for the rich people? Why don't you cut it for the poor people? Boom, you're lost. You can't, even, you can't even get away from our street before there's debates on what you're going to do with it. I've been on these panels, all right? Before the panel's over, people are saying, well, we should do this, we should do that. And that's the whole problem. You don't just say, well, we have a swell idea. It goes straight to the Treasury. They implement it. All right? You have to be realistic, and it's irresponsible to propose policies that you know will be abused before they're enacted. And that's what we've seen over and over. Let's cut spending first. James, you still have a minute if you'd like to chime in. We're good. OK. <laughs> then your, your time to rebut. You have a minute. <laughs> Oh, oh, but, yeah, so David, does that include Charles Krauthammer's uh, proposal for a net zero gas tax in the teeth of the Great Recession? National, the, the cover of National Review in uh, 2009, Krauthammer's article was there. He's proposing a net zero gas tax. And so is he also included in this, uh, the, this uh, uh, ephemeral thinking that we've got going on here, that it's all theoretical. What he was talking about was a floating gas tax with corresponding cuts to FICA taxes, which, by the way, again, I would congratulate Heritage, is right to be concerned about regressivity. And if you're concerned about regressivity, then operating on the FICA tax, as, as Krauthammer does in that piece in 2009, is a great way to do it, because the most regressive tax we got is a FICA tax. So Krauthammer is talking about a, an adjustable gas tax. Is that, is, is, is he also smoking the pixie dust or? I can't answer. Oh, you can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps later in the lobby. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, fi the final question is from uh, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Kreutzer. All right, thank you, Ron. Boy, so many potential questions and I have to limit it to one. So. What I'll do is I will push the envelope and answer like a single question in three subparts. But feel free to call out stop and only answer one if you like. I'm going to try, though. First of all, I'm very happy that we do agree that if we're going to even consider a carbon tax, uh, that up front you say everything else has to go in terms of EPA regulations across the board, subsidies, all that. I think that, is, that would have to be a necessary precondition. I still think we're apart, but I'm glad that we're in agreement on that. And I think that's something we should all take away from that, and that we are in agreement that we have to have those necessary preconditions. Now, that being the case, 
First of all, just as a question, I think I know the answer, but I just want to hear you say it. Will you walk away from this proposal if first, if you do not first get EPA to repeal all those regulations such that we're not relying on a promise from federal government later? So in other words, do you agree that that has to be as a necessary precondition to your trade-off carbon tax, all these EPA regulations must be taken off the books first? Second, do you believe this really would happen in the real world? This gets to the point that we've been making all along. I mean, you know, we can talk about what we'd like to see happen in La La Land, and I don't, I don't mean to say that derisively. I'm just saying, in the real world, it's not going to happen. I wish it would. If it would, we have a starting point. Do you really think it's possible? And then finally, when you talk about balancing things out, if we do impose a tax on carbon dioxide, then, and then you say, well, then we're also going to take into account other externalities, which again is a good point. Um, so tell me, how would you put a tax on bald eagle, bald eagle deaths, California condor deaths, land development for wind turbines? What type of mechanism can you do? You have two That's one question in three that, parts. I, I, I could hear the ands. <laughs> Fascinating. You so, have, uh, we have can, two minutes. Uh, don't worry, we can do this quickly. Uh, yes. Uh, to the question of will it happen, I, I think I can tell you what will not happen, which is that the EPA isn't going to get rid of the regulations just because James and David want them to. Right? There is going to need to be a policy replacement for those regulations. Whether we like it or not, there is going to need to be one. The difference between us is I think that we are proposing something that would do that. I don't think that you are. Uh, as for bald eagles, I mean, come on. You know, we, we can talk about every externality in the world uh, if you want to, and there are millions of them. What we are talking about is something uh, uh, burning fossil fuels and carbon dioxide emissions that is an enormous part of our economy, that's one of the most studied externalities on the face of the planet. And let me point out that pricing externalities is completely non-controversial on this panel uh, among best practices in governments. Uh, you know, gasoline taxes are a perfect example of pricing externalities that people place on the road. I, I don't imagine that either of you are going to get up today and say that, no, 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 that structure doesn't make sense. We shouldn't price that externality. That's what we're talking about doing here. You have another 40 seconds if you'd like to use it. I, I'd just add uh, about the bald eagles. Actually, it does show one of the really difficult questions here, which is how do you value? Um, how do you these are value judgments you have to make. And rather than denying that, in other words, uh, the wind operators need to be accountable for that. And then you start a debate about what that price is, that externality is, and that's a tough question. Um, our hope uh, in what we're talking about is we move beyond denial and into debate. If we do that, then there are a lot of things to work and grapple with, because they're tough questions. Um, but it doesn't really help just deny that there's a problem, say, with those externalities associated with wind, for example, or solar, or nuclear, which I'm a big fan of, or other uh, forms of energy. You got to put the cost in and then grapple with how you figure what those costs are. You have one minute rebuttal. Speaking of, of denial, I'm glad you use that term because it's impossible to deny that wind turbines kill 440,000 birds each and every year at a minimum, even while we're barely producing any wind. You ramp it up, you're getting a lot more. You can talk about how difficult it is to put a price on it. Well, we darn well better do it if we're even going to think about this program, which you know you say would happen in the first place. Let me turn it over to David. He's itching to go. <laughs> this is a couple of responses. OK. Uh, talking about pricing all the externalities, no, I do not want to have the busybody government pricing every externality. Did I go to sleep early enough so that I don't get a cold to spread to somebody else? Am I taking my vitamin pills? There are all kinds of trivial externalities. We don't want them. I, you talked about Professor Pagu. Um, I had a professor named James Buchanan who founded the Public Choice School of Economics, and he railed rightfully. He was brilliant. He said, we have seen a century of Paguvian economists come through, giving power to government to rectify this externality and that externality as though the government will take their recommendations, run straight down to the Treasury, run straight down to the regulatory agency, implement them as the professors say. We know that doesn't happen. If you give government the power that can be abused, you should expect them to abuse it, and you need to be careful. And a lot of these externality solutions give them too much power. So we're now coming toward the conclusion of our debate, and there will be closing statements. Each team gets three minutes to close, as I understand it. And so we will start with Mr. Taylor and Mr. Kreutzer. Three minutes, please. 
Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for showing up. It reminds me that the people that we love the most and we're closest to are the ones we have the strongest and sharpest disagreements with. I mean, isn't that true? I go home and my wife and I have sharper disagreements than I have with anybody else, and yet we forgive, we forgive each other and love each other afterwards. So thanks so much. I'm glad to count you guys as friends. I'm very happy that we do agree that as a necessary precondition for any of these tax trade-offs, we are all in agreement that EPA has to eliminate all of its regulatory schemes in place. We have to take out all these, uh, all these programs that are harming our economy, that are being done so in the name of environmental progress. What we're really discussing now, in my opinion, maybe we can disagree, but we're just we're arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin because we know it's not going to happen. If you guys can make it happen and I'll help you make it happen, I think we can have that talk. I'm still not in favor of it, but I think at least we have a starting point. And I'd love to see it happen, and I'm glad that we're in agreement that that has to happen before we can even talk about a carbon tax. And again, thanks a lot, guys. I really do appreciate being up here with you. It's an honor. Two, um, mi two know, minutes. I, I feel like we're talking with some decent people who are about to fall for a trap that we've seen conservatives fall for over and over. It's like, you know, we're going to keep offering the liberals more tax revenue, more capitulation, more uh, deals on regulation. Hey, okay, we'll give you that, but we're going to get something until they say we've had enough. Thank you. That's not, you know, th that's a stupid way to go about it. We know that we're not going to get a deal like this for the carbon tax. And so we're not talking about a second best. We're talking about an even worse. That's the solution that we're offering here. Yeah, the, is the government so broken? Is democracy so ineffective that it's absolutely impossible to repeal some regulations? Have we, can't we not do that? Maybe we better call you king if, we're in, if we can't do that. Thank you. So far, the answer has been yes. Uh, over the course of the evening, you've heard us uh, disagree with our friends on a lot of things, but ultimately there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. Uh, we all probably think that Al Gore is kind of a jerk, for example. Uh, and so, <laughs> so well, just um, Now, we obviously have a, a strong disagreement on a carbon tax, though. I think that under certain circumstances it could make sense. Revenue neutral, regulatory preemption, eliminating existing taxes. Um, <laughs> But I think that, you know, despite the fact that it's not on the horizon right now policy-wise, this is an important debate. And the reason it's an important debate is because I have this nagging thought in the back of my mind that conservatives may end up on this issue where we ended up on health care, which is yelling from the sidelines, no, no, God, no, please, no, don't listen to the liberals, don't do that. Uh, and eventually we got steamrolled. And the reason that we got steamrolled is that we never put forward authentically conservative solutions there were solutions that were put forward. I would dispute their authentic conservatism from certain think tanks. Uh, and so what we are trying to do is put forward an authentically conservative solution uh, to deal with that, to make sure that we don't end up in the same place that we did on health care. Yep. Um, Two minutes. So uh, first of all, I, I guess I, I do uh, differ a little bit with what Andrew just said. I, I respect Al Gore for bringing the attention of the world to the issue, and so we can be grateful for that. Um, I will tell you that um, the risk, there's a substantive risk and political risk here, it seems to me. The risk that your side is running, James and David, substantively, is that if you're wrong, it could be really bad. The risk that we're running is that we might just do a Pagovian tax swap. And that wouldn't be so bad. And because even if James especially is right on the substance of the climate issue, and you believe, for example, that it, human activity has nothing to do with it, it's a little bit like the doctor who thinks it's all about your genes, about your health. But doctor, would it hurt me to diet and exercise? In other words, if we cleaned up the air, would it be really bad for us? Or would it be just, oh, that's all right then? In other words, a harmless error, perhaps, unless you think, as James says, that maybe it's really positive to have that there. But anyway, so there's a substantive risk that you're running. There's a substantive risk that we're running. There's a political risk that you're running. This is what Andrew was just on to, and it follows up on a point that Dave made about the trap. The trap we're about to step into is having, as Andrew just said so rightly, no alternative. Because you know what? Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, no alternatives that we put forward effectively. And the result was the liberals who think that you can get something for nothing and that there is such a thing as a free lunch brought all those programs in, and now we're suffering with the things that David rightly points out about our deficit. 
So we either get with it and, all, and engage with a real solution in free enterprise, or we acquiesce when the nation decides they want action for a regulatory solution. I, for one, hope we choose a price signal and watch the free enterprise system fix this thing. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both teams. I think they did an excellent job. Uh, I, I do think that, as, as dark as it is, why don't we try to do a division of the house on the proposition, all right? I've seen the RSVP list. That might not be good for us. <laughs> Well, you might have won some people over. The, the re, I want to remind the, the audience what the resolution was. Resolved, under no circumstances should conservatives support a tax on carbon emissions. Those in favor, that is, there should be no tax, would you please rise so that we can see? I'd like to see hands, but please rise because it's going to be hard otherwise. Oh. What do you all estimate that being? Looks like about one person, I think. OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm puzzled by this. All right, please be seated. And those who think there are some circumstances under which conservative support should support a tax on carbon emissions, please stand. Can we get another division of the House? No, no, hold on. This was the resolution. Uh, well, it, it, I, I, yeah. Please be seated. The, the answer is, the, uh, I believe that Mr. Inglis and, uh, and uh, Mr. Moylan side wins this debate. I think they, oh, did no, you get no, some no, ringers no, in? Get the audience. I wasn't in the meeting, but we're on. Can we get the two? <laughs> <laughs>